All right, so let's tee it up. What are we, uh, what problem are we trying to solve today? Well, I think, um, I think one of the problems that I run into all the time doing demos and stuff is let's do some virtual things, put it up and fire it up and have it connect to the internet. That way I don't have to worry about, um, you know, when I'm out there like researching and clicking on bad stuff. And for the purposes yeah. of this, I think we could um, fire it up, connect to the internet, then go download some of the new stuff that uh, uh, Ericom ZT Edges got out there and turn it on. Yeah, let's do it. So looking at Hypercube here, um, this is new stuff for me because I've been playing with your, your other stuff for a while. Walk me through what I need to do. I mean, like I, said, I, I, think, sure. I think it's very fair to let people know that do watch this. This is not leading the witness. I, I haven't used this. <laughs> yep. All right. So this is, this is your main screen when you log in. Um, each blueprint, you can consider your own, your own private cloud or your own, your own isolated playground that you can do stuff inside of. Um, so you have a test blueprint, but why don't we start a brand new one for today? All right, so create new blueprint. Yep. And then we'll call this uh, now active host. What does main mean? Sure. So right now, um, inside of your organization, you have one active host. That's that's the machine that all your VMs are going to run on. Okay. So it, it auto selects the one that's active for you. But the idea is if you need to scale, if you need to like for if you need to have a conference or you need you have a one time event where you need like 40, 50 environments and they're huge, you can spin up multiple hosts, scale up to handle that and then spin it back down. OK, so if I had more than that, I would have different stuff in here other than main, right? Yeah, there'd be other other names in there. OK, so create. And now when I click create, it basically just gave me an environment, right? Yep. This is your blank canvas that you can start building things on top of. Okay. And then looking at my, my, cause I'm familiar with the canvas here. <laughs> um, I can, you know, type notes like, uh, you know, this, uh, this is an internet connected uh, demo environment. Right. I mean, that's kind of useful if you're going to come back and look at stuff later. So now the next thing would be to put a couple of machines out here. Yep. So let's see, create a machine, adds a machine to this blueprint, creates these. So I like that you guys have got kind of uh, idiot proof, you know, notes. So like when I was create a machine, they're create a machine. So let's call this uh, Windows 10 um, icons. You've got different icons, whatever. Uh, and we're going to load a Windows 10 Pro, right? Yep. Yep. You're right. still on the, uh, let's call it beta release of this particular product. So we don't have all the icons for all the different operating systems in there yet, but we're working right. on it. So there's my Windows machine creating, it's spinning up, doing all the, you know, building the VM stuff. Yep. Behind the scenes, it's creating that VM, but that doesn't stop you from doing other things in parallel. So well, you're able to like create... Oh, sorry, I talked over you. What was that? What's the next thing I need to do to get this thing out to the internet? Um, deploy a network. Which is, okay, create a network. So we can just call it that, right? Internet yep. outbound, okay. Create it, so. Now when you say create the network, what is that doing? Behind the scenes, that's creating a network that you can attach this VM to. And that network already has DHCP and will provide internet access. So you don't have to do anything. As soon as that Windows 10 machine is done being created, you will be able to wire it to that network. And then that's it. It'll connect to the internet and off you go. So is there any firewalling going on there? Or right now, there's no firewalling. It's just me to this thing to the internet. Right now, it's just you to that thing out to the internet. Nothing can come, there is some firewalling at the edge, so nothing can come back in. But okay. yeah, as far as you getting out is concerned, you're good to go. Okay. So that says offline. So that means it's up and it's there, right? So now I just yep. have to turn it on. 
Now you just turn it on. All right, start, stop. So now it's oh. on. Oh, I should have said this before. So you can only wire up networks while a machine is off. Okay. So uh, I hit stop, so it should stop. And then when it stops, I can connect it network-wise to that machine. Yep, that is correct. Um, and so the other interesting thing here is uh, our audience isn't going to be able to see this, but I can look at this environment as well. So can you, in the top right-hand side, click the share link? Copy link? Yep. And then put that in the chat? Yep. If you put that in the chat. Since I'm a part of your organization, I can view that as well. And so this is pretty key, right? Because if you're doing stuff where you're going to have um, people building things in real time, I mean, we're, we're basically working together on either side of this. Yeah. Can you refresh the page real quick? Yeah. And that could be my internet that's a little bit blippy too, so. Offline, so now I should be able to connect it to there. And that's it, huh? And that's it. When you turn that machine on, you will be good to go. That's pretty cool, because that saves a lot of the um, problem of like uh, building your own little network. I mean. I think anybody can click and drag and click start. <laughs> At least I would hope so. Yep. So started machine online. Okay. And this is coming up as a template Windows machine, right? Yeah. So the next step is we want to look at the machine. So if you click view, And, and then for the, folks, for the folks that watch this, they'll know this is real because we're eating while we're doing stuff. I mean, this is <laughs> as unpolished as you get. And I'm going to send you the credentials in the chat to log into that machine. All right. Yep. All right. Makes perfect sense. Um, and I'm going to let me. Stop sharing for a second so I can grab the link that I'm going to need while that's spinning up. Uh, cha -cha -cha. And I'm going to put that in the chat so we can just edit this out later. I'm just using that as literally to share what I'm going to be looking at. Okay, let me turn this back on. All right, so we're back up. There's my Windows machine. And I'll log in with what you said was the creds. And on your end, you're still able to jump in and do stuff on this box, right? Absolutely. So, in fact, what I'll do here is um, just to show you show you that I can see. Uh, bring up bring up a text editor or something. All right. Or command prompt. I don't command know. So prompt. It, it looks computery, right? Oh, look, there you are. You're typing. Nice. And that's like my hands are here, so that's not me gaming any system. <laughs> yep. So I can hop into any of the machines and view what you're doing. Um, so we're like we're like collaborating real time on a machine. That we are. So there, there's a netstat command, folks. So now it looks all computery, right? We just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so now we've got that. Let's kill this and bring up a browser. Firefox is fine because no one uses Edge. I mean, let's just be real about it. <laughs> and we got to go to the link that I shared, which actually, for the purposes of collaborating, I put the link that we need to go download this thing in the chat. Go grab. You go grab it and throw it in the browser and let's download that. And start. All right. 
And look, here's me not typing. So this is Craig and I collaborating in real time, testing and demoing stuff um, on the far end of this. This is, I mean, this is pretty, pretty slick, man. All right, so there we go. Yep, save that file. Internet's up and quick and pretty quick fast as well. So I'm not gonna run into a whole lot of lag here, which is good. So there's my, my installer, cool. Now I just need to go open that bad boy up. And like anything else on Windows, you have to yell at it and say, the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> so there, run it. There we go, ZT Edge installer, like everybody else is familiar. Install, you know, doing its thingy. Yes. And we're just, I mean, this is anybody that's ever installed an application in the history of anything, seen this stuff. So, you know, you're just up and doing uh, configuration. I mean, I think next time we do this, we should uh, go do some Ubuntu Linux type thing. Um, I was looking around and there could be some pretty interesting um, configuration stuff to do in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this for the purposes of a vendor product. I mean, that's for those that are watching, essentially what we're doing is we're going to go um, download the new agent that we're using for ZT Edge, um, fire it up, do a couple of things real quick. And then that's really the crux of it. I mean, the, the point to make here is in real time, let's see, we started this at, 106 it's now 118 we've turned a vm on connected it to a network went out to the internet and we're getting uh applications so that we can actually use this stuff and do customer demo and of course it's microsoft edge is what's slowing this thing down there's a shocker <laughs> Yeah, so talk talk to me a little bit about what uh, what we're going to do with ZT Edge here. Yeah, so this is the the agent that we have now, and um, essentially what we do is we're running um, remote browser isolation through the cloud, and then we're connecting everything on the back end to the ZTNA controllers so that we can pipe where you're supposed to go and take away everything that you shouldn't need to see. Uh, and I'll show you with this thing, like I'll go to a phishing site, I'll show you a couple other pieces that. We're still going to let you look at content on the internet, even if it's even if it's literally malicious content. We'll let you look at it, but we're going to parse all the bad stuff out in the cloud so that you can't infect your machine. Um, and that sounds you're kind of like, okay, well, isn't that what antivirus does? True. The issue that we're talking about though is this is happening out in the cloud, whereas if it was AV, it's already on your machine. PowerShell and all those other bad things can cause problems. So like, you know, if we're looking at the client, um, all the packages, everything else is there. All I'm going to do is enter the cloud, which I believe uh, mine is Ericom, if I remember correctly. And let me double check that I have the right one. Let me pause sharing for a second. It's going to take a picture of my head over here in a second. Authentication was rejected. That's weird. So this could also be useful for troubleshooting new installation procedures. Which is, yep, totally what we're figuring out. Well, so it looks like there's a back-end issue. We can, I do have a back, another uh, thing we could mess with, um, which would be in the Linux deal, if you want to do that. Uh, All right. Well, uh, before before we do that, let me just say uh, congratulations on using Hypercube to discover a backend issue with your product. We, will, we found a problem. Right? So. <laughs> yep. Now you guys can go off to the races and go fix it. Uh, yeah. Let's check out whatever you had to do for Linux. Okay. Let me shut this one down and then we'll share and fire up a Linux box. All right.
Now, I'm kind of curious what happens here. When you're sharing your screen, I'm going to deploy the Linux blocks from my side and see if it automatically shows up on your canvas. Right. All right, let's see. Let me stop this one. Windows, stop. And share. All right, so this is this one will be all new to me because I was just messing with this. Um, let's add a Linux machine. Uh, what's this tool called? I believe it's called the fish. And it's, let's see, Ubuntu should be, I think the newest one should be fine. Yep. We'll create that machine. Now, the Ubuntu boxes do get created a lot faster. They are yeah. a lot smaller than the Windows boxes. <laughs> Excuse me. So, mental note, use Ubuntu because it's better. <laughs> and this one up. All right. Wow, that's fast. Okay. And then we'll go view. Well, it'll get there in a second. So, when you click that button, it sends the power on signal. It does power the box up. But the uh, the box has not booted to the part where you can actually view the VNC connection yet. So, gotcha. so it takes a minute. Yeah, and one of the things we're working on is a way to test: can I see the VNC connection? All right. So there's my hypercube, and I'm guessing we'll use same, same credentials as the other one. Yeah. yeah. All right. So there's that. Now, the fun part is going to be, because everyone knows open source software never has a problem, <laughs> we'll go look at, uh, can I, you can blow the screen up more or two, or how do you do that? No, we're adding that in, but for right now, it's fixed resolution. Um, okay. In the, coming out in the next two weeks, it'll automatically expand to fill the whole screen. Okay. And we'll also have a, like, uh, fill the whole, whole screen button. Full screen. Nice. Uh, and let's go. I want to look for GitHub. There was a. I believe this is it. Uh, yeah, I think this is it. Actually, we'll just do the Google thing. There we go. So I thought this was just kind of interesting from, hang on one second, working dogs. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is an automated um, fish email analysis tool, which has got some other stuff built into it. I've never used this thing before. I just thought there's a whole like market around uh, how all this stuff is supposed to work. So if we went through and just installed it, um, it could be interesting. Yeah. But then I got to find, there's a guide. So let's see, Docker images, guide. Uh, let's see. All right, and then here's this old Docker thing, which if you're not totally familiar, so now we're gonna need a uh, terminal. And then we get to do all the cool computer looking stuff. <laughs> and you can copy and paste inside the VM. So like if you select the text inside the VM, you can copy and paste. So then you're saying I can just go in here and paste that, right? Yeah. I believe I, oh. Uh, All right, cool. And then this doesn't even have uh, Git on it, does it? Uh, it does not look. No, it should. You have an extra dollar sign in your Git command. Basically. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Syntax will get you every time. <laughs> OK. 
Command git not found. Okay, fine. Apt install git. Yeah, do all the things. Sweet, lots of blinky lights, computer <laughs> computer stuff. All right. And in that same environment, uh, I went ahead and created a machine and I'm racing and following alongside you. So I'm installing okay. it as well. We're trying to beat each other now. Cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's see. So that's that command gets me this. Clones does that. Let's do CD into the fish slash Docker. Okay. And then we're going to do, I've no, I haven't done a whole lot of Docker stuff recently, so I'm sure I'll mess this up. Um, Docker tag compose up. Docker, uh, oh, there we go. Another app install. Okay. Yes. Oh, very cool. Okay. So if you want to make that screen bigger, mm -hmm. by the way, um, you just go into the actual VM and change the resolution, and it'll change the resolution on your screen here. Oh, nice. So I can do that in the, uh, where's that setting? So if you click on the squares in the bottom. Display, and then type, right? Yes. Yeah. And then it's under appearance, if I remember right. No, I you, you already had it. It's under it displays. Was, yeah. Uh, what was it? Displays. There we go. Go, which probably we're at 1024, so go with uh, let's do this. And one. if you scroll down, there's a there's a bunch more resolutions because that might make it too big, probably too big. Uh, scroll down, let's see, let's do 16 by 9. Uh, one more try, one more try. There's a 1200 in there. 1280 by 1024. Yeah. That should be. Actually, 1280 by that. There we go. All right, cool. Uh, let's see. Okay, so there's all that stuff. Uh, clear that out. And then let's see what our next step is. Because if we don't do it right, we will get a problem. Okay. Uh, Docker tech compose. Up. Probably doesn't have Docker composed. Uh, no, I think I just installed that. Oh, you have to sudo. I already sudoed. Yeah, I'm sudo. I'm already I'm already root man. Let's see. Well, let's try and run that command again. Yeah. Hang on, let me shut these dogs up. All right. Did you get the same error on your end when you were running it? Yeah, I'm about to run that command and find out. So let's get me a new terminal. Let's see. Docker attack compose up. Proxy variable is not set. String. Uh, interesting. Okay. So that's, again, this is not something I've done with Docker. So I am at a loss. <laughs> so I'm just about there. I'm finishing up installing Docker compose right now. Oh, it's working on your end. Okay. Uh, well, do you want to share your screen? And since we're collaborating in real time, we could jump back and forth that way. That's probably a good. Sure. Actually, if you want to watch me install it, let's try this. So uh, share your screen and go okay. back to the page. Go back to the uh, thing that you were at, the, um, the blueprint. Uh, okay, blueprint. Yep. And now refresh the page. All right. So I'm in there in Craig's Linux, and if you want to click view, you can watch me install. Nice. 
All right. All right. So let's see. Docker Compose is installed now. So now let's. Oh, shucks. Okay. Now we're good. Still good. All right. Now let's come over here and find that command for the Docker Compose. Docker Compose tech up, I think. Yeah. I think I need, I also need to install Git. So. Okay, and now I'm pretty sure I just need to clone this thing and go from there. So installation. Uh, install it using Docker, using Docker and Docker Compose. Or install it from scratch, either one. Yeah, I saw that. If you do that, it makes you... Oh, you um, have to have Hive and Cortex and all those stuff. Yeah, you have to set up all that other shenanigans. Right. Blah, blah, blah. We were uh, said... Project, provides Docker images and Docker Compose templates here. Okay. Yeah, it says, please refer to this guide to install the fish using Docker and Docker Compose. That guide right there is the one you want. Yep. So now if you go down, yep. Go back up a little bit. Here we yep. go. Clone, do so that thing. Copy that. Yep. Come over here. Let's paste that in. By the way, I would have killed to have this capability when I was doing all the training and education stuff because I can't remember, I don't know how many days of my life I spent screaming at the screen and yelling to try and get, you know, you to do this and me to do that. And I'm like, we're just back and forth in real time playing with stuff. Yep. Ah, see if I can not fat finger it. There we go. You got to go into the Docker directory. Oh, got to go into the Docker directory and then run Docker pose up. All right. We'll be interested to see if you get the same error that I did. See, there you go. Same error. I did. Okay. The version in Docker Compose.yaml is not supported. So let's do a quick ls. Uh, Docker Compose YAML. Oh, I don't have Vim. All right, let's use the I. Old school stuff. Oh, yeah, you're brave. So it doesn't like version 3.8, but it gave me uh, 2.2. Two. Yeah, let's see what happens if I do that. Two offs. Oh, now you're going to be I. <laughs> no, I got it. I, I, I'm the wizard. I got to remember I'm in VI now. So delete, delete, insert to escape, escape, colon, right. Now it's coming back. Woo! Yeah. Right. Been brave. <laughs> now let's see if it gets mad at us. Oh, there we go. Oh, couldn't connect to the Docker daemon. So let's try sudo docker. It may have been installed. There we go. Uh oh. Wow, look at here. I mean, in this, I like I, I would say again, from the perspective of having done this stuff for demos and students and whatever else, like the fact that we're, uh, something wasn't working for me, we jump on yours, we're back and forth in real time and we're, you know, moving forward, like that's pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, downloading all the Docker images. All the stuff. Docker things. So much Docker. Hey, remember when Docker was gonna take over the world? Yeah. I remember too when people were like, oh, it's super lightweight and Docker's never gonna be, like, no, there's a, there's a lot of stuff there. Like, this is not, uh, you know, the bits are not any smaller. Yeah. You want to know a really good way to fill up your hard drive fast? Start using Docker. Yeah. But I mean, it is nice that it's it's basically when it's there, it's a package and it's just dumped onto there. When it works, it's life changing. Yeah. And this, for the record, for everybody that checks this thing out, for the record, this is when someone tells you that open source just works. No. You have to do this type of like, oh, this error fell. Oh, let's go fix this. And yeah, like I had to make up 2.0 or 2.2 or whatever in the I version. Don't know what 2 is, but whatever. <laughs> like, that's, what it, that's what it says it wants. Then by God, we're going to hard code it in there. Yeah. I guess I also could spend the next hour trying to upgrade Docker to version 3.8 or whatever the newest one is. But uh, yeah. Well, I think I think what's actually good, right, is if we do this in a couple of um, 
in, in a couple of s sessions. So like mm -hmm. maybe in the next X number of minutes, we'll get this thing down. And then I don't know, we'll jump back on tomorrow or whatever, whenever you want. And we'll do the next piece of this and we can just. Yep. You know, it. Cause I gotta go figure out what the hell they messed up on the back into my other thing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll cut together a video that, that is like, uh, us discovering, aha, there's a, there's a back end bug we discovered. Um, and I'll get your guys approval first before I release it or anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's part of what we can, as far as the marketing side of this, right. Is if we, if we go at it as, as troubleshooting a demo and whatever else, and then this piece here, it would be cool to put this out and be like, look, we're going to build a, a free open source version for a phishing, um, phishing thing. Yep. Oh, small, small favor. Can you move your mouse off of the, um, out of the VM? There we go. That is one thing, like it, it, it interferes a little bit if your mouse is on top of it. All right, let's see what the next installation step is. Cause it's doing lots of things. It's failing, it's doing all kinds of stuff. All right, so if the logs start showing a whole bunch of errors, which they are, all right, so we're back. Um, we had a bit of a kerfuffle because anytime you do POCs and demos and mess with software, nothing ever works like someone says it will. So value of this type of system, we found something was wrong. It was a misconfiguration on the far end. Fixed it. As you can tell, we're wearing different clothes. So it's been a little bit uh, in case somebody's actually really paying attention to details. But now we're going to drop into this machine right here, which is the Windows 10 up and online and then i'm going to do a little bit of uh demo on remote browser isolation so here is that machine um craig fair to say that this is just a regular windows 10 box just doing windows yep. 10 stuff. vanilla windows 10. so okay so right now it's doing regular windows things it's got nothing no sort of security controls or zt edgy anything on it so let's look at this so right now if i'm on actually yeah this one's fine so if i'm on um, CNN and I go look at, you know, CNN, 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 whatever. It's just the internet, big deal. If I go look at dirty websites that, uh, you wouldn't want people to look at dirty websites or dirty websites. Um, <laughs> if I go to like, let's say fanduel.com where you can do gambling and that type of thing, you know, could be an issue. Uh, and then on top of that, if I'm trying to do like web development on an internal resource, right? Like this 0.4. Um, well, that's just a cached page, but when I try and connect to it, I'm not actually connecting to it. So that could be a problem for developers. The other piece, if I'm trying to go like remote desktop to a box that I should have access to, um, normally I got to do VPNs, more accesses, more passwords, more shenanigans. It's just painful. So like right now I'm trying to connect to it. I can't get to it, even though I should be able to, um, same sort of thing if I'm trying to go to another box that's within that subnet that I should be able to get to like this 153, you know, I should be able to get to that machine. But the point being right now, I don't have anything that's allowing that connectivity to take place unless I did that old, you know, VPN and all of the crap, right? So let's, um, we, we downloaded the agent. Like we said, we figured out that there was a, an issue. We fixed it. Now this is the new cool, sexy stuff. So Basically, there's my guy, my Ricky Bobby, um, just because I like to be an idiot and use pop culture names. <laughs> so so now I'm just going to connect Ricky Bobby. And you can see, like, if I was MSSP or if I was a service provider or whatever, I could have multiple profiles in here. Um, I'm going to connect him. Now, it's using my phone to send me an MFA token. It's going to do my MFA thing, and it's going to connect me in. There, I'm done. Notice I didn't enter a password. I didn't do whatever. It literally sent the thing to my phone. My phone looked at my big, ugly head and said, <laughs> yes, that's Chase. And it offed me. So I'm done. That's it. I didn't change anything else. I didn't configure anything else. Now, if I'm trying to go back to that same box that I should have access to,
because the policy on the back end, this is so people understand ZTNA, I can get to it. So notice no more passwords. I just jump to the box. There I go. Life goes on. Super easy. Do your thing. Same sort of thing. Try and go to that 153, which is something I should have access to. I think I changed the policy. Or maybe that 153 is actually down. So this is a good way of saying, like, even if it's in the same subnet, 153 and 154, because I don't know that it's there, I can't actually scan and get to it. I wouldn't see that that box is available. So the point being there, notice I can't RDP to that machine. It doesn't exist because the policy on the back end says Chase can't get to 153, even though same subnet as 148. Make sense? Yep. Um, back on the browser side, you know, I need to go to this 0.4. I'm on 0.4. I didn't do anything, no more auth or whatever else, just, you know, problem solved. If I try and go to a dirty website, dirty websites are not cool because there's lots of bad things on dirty websites. The policy says, no, no, you're not supposed to be going to porn at work. We're going to block that. Um, CNN, regular websites just look like regular websites. But what you'll notice here is see where it's that little star comes up and says, mm -hmm. uh, basically, that's an indicator that the parsing of all the iframes and JavaScripts are happening out in the cloud. And I'll show you what I mean. So if I go down here and go to that nifty, cool, where's the, uh, I think it's developer tools or settings, right? Is it more tools? Uh, yeah, web developer tools. <laughs> I always have to right click and view source to get my to get to get my to developer it? tools because I can never remember how to go through the menu. Yeah. So see where it says security policies are preventing you from visiting this page. Yeah. That's actually a security control that's saying Chase is trying to re-engineer the web page and get around. So it's not letting me look at the actual uh code, which is a good thing. This is a security control. But the bet the regular web page. CNN stuff works just fine. If I try and go to like YouTube or whatever, YouTube will look just like YouTube. And this is all running out in the cloud. So this browser is not actually operating on my local machine, but there's no weird clippiness. It looks like browser. So here's the same sort of website. It's just so people can tell like, I'm not scamming the system. Like that's video and look how fast it's yeah, coming through. I can't tell at all. That's awesome. No. Now, now yeah, here's that another one. So, shockingly good for being embedded in this web page. Right. It's pretty crazy. So on top of that, like here's a, a phishing site that I know is a phishing site. And this is a very common thing for a user. If Google or uh, Firefox, whatever here has told me, hey, dummy, this is a deceptive site. Don't go to this deceptive site. But because I'm a user, because people do this, I say up yours, Google, up yours, whatever. I know more than you. Um, I want to see the details because this is what people do. And yeah, I still want to go this site, whatever. Um, I'm going to ignore the risk and go, you know, whatever. I don't even need to worry about this thing. What's happening here is the parsing is taking place. So notice this alert came up again that mm -hmm. said, hey, dummy, security alert, phishing site. But it said, because you might need to see this, I'm going to let you see the content, but I'm going to render all the bad stuff read only. So. Okay. Here I am on the site, but notice when I actually go to do something, like I'll go look at the contact menu. The contact menu is rendered in a read-only mode. So when it shows up here in just a second, there's the contact form. If this was a, you know, enter your username and password or whatever. Gotcha. I physically, you can hear me typing. I can't type. Read-only so, mode. That's awesome. Right. Yeah, so basically the, the crux of it is I'll still let the user see the content like, you know, the you might need it for work, but we're parsing all the bad stuff and making it where it's safe, kind of whether you like it or not. So yeah. I think this, in my opinion, you know, really eliminates that issue you have with um, people circumventing your controls on the Internet. And this, I mean, let's be real, like this is where you're going to interact with malicious content is on the browser, on the web. Yeah. So this could be if I was in my... Um, my Gmail and someone sent me a malicious link, the malicious link will, you know, not work. Or if you clicked on it, it would take you to the site, but it would parse all the bad stuff and you couldn't interact with the bad thing anyway. You know, there's FanDuel, which is a gambling site. If I remember correctly, the policy we have right now says, yeah, it's blocked. So I can take it away. Uh, now on the, the far end of this, if I turn all this stuff off, 
you know, literally just turn it off. Yeah, do you sure you want to shut this down? Yes, I want to shut it down. Now I'm back on regular old internet and I'm not running in the secure mode anymore. Can't get back to that box. Yep. Or if I try and go back online, you can go to FanDuel all day long. You know, you can go look at dirty pornography all day long, whatever you want. So the, the point being, the ZTNA stuff is happening on the back end. The user is rendered secure. And then all the stuff that would typically be a problem is being removed from the user being able to access stuff. Um, and that, like, that literally is how hard it is to get this up and running. It's just like everybody does. You download an app, you turn it on, and then you enter your creds. And depending on the backend configuration, you maybe never enter another password again. You can do biometric, you can do MFA, you could tie it to your, uh, your Google authenticator, you know, however you want to do it, and you're done. Um, so from the perspective of BYOD, it works pretty well. So, um, you know, that that's the cool thing about a really good security approach is that's it's super simple. Like, that's it. I mean, that. Yeah. And it's transparent. Like, I didn't have to interact with 50 different pieces of software before I could turn this thing on. No, I mean, it, it's it's simple enough that if you know how to use the browser, you can use this thing um, just quickly. If we do look at this since we're doing demos, if we do look at this thing and I'll connect one more time, because I get this question a lot. If you go in here and look, right? A lot of times people would say, well, what if I go through the airport and I jump from one Wi-Fi to the next or whatever? If you turn this toggle on for reconnect, anytime electrons are moving, you're back on the secure pipe. So easy to do. If you have more than one profile on that, on that box, maybe you have me and my kids use the same machine, but we use different profiles. Mine needs to be secure, theirs doesn't. Change the profile. Uh, gotcha. You could also go from, when do you set it up? Do you do it at login or at boot? Now, you can, on the administrator side of this, push this out, like through Active Directory, mm -hmm. and say, everybody, whenever your machine boots, you're on the pipe. So that control is available to you. But the point here is to say, it's really however you want to configure it for your users, you could do that. Gotcha. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the cool thing about a good demo is it's not super complicated, yep. not really hard. We found a problem. We fixed a problem. We got up and running. That is for the question of folks, what, is, what does RBI look like? That's RBI. <laughs> well, well done, sir.